before I introduce the two people who will be speaking, <coughs> I thought I would like to say something that's just caught my attention. Um, I was with Amy Goodman on Saturday night at the Paramount Theater, along with a panel of other people, and then Sunday morning at a brunch. So I'm wearing my KBCS Democracy Now! button. And the relevance of that, it just struck me how it's not something new that our government's concerned about trying to control the media. And in this, I think, very, very fine book that Amy and her brother wrote called The Exception to the Rulers, now out in paperback, if you were to get it and turn to the chapter on Hiroshima, the story is that there was an Australian reporter who defied the military order not to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and 30 days after the bombing went in and saw the devastation. And he sat down on his small typewriter and typed out a story that had worldwide ramifications when it was published in a London newspaper. And what he talked about is what it looked like when he was there seeing Hiroshima, and he talked about the radiation sickness. 30 days after the bombing, the people there who were dying still, their hair was falling out, they were ill, and they were dying. Now, <clears throat> there was another reporter who covered science for the New York Times, won a Pulitzer Prize, and he did a front page story basically saying this other reporter was just conveying Japanese propaganda propaganda even after the war, and said, there is no such thing as radiation sickness, or if anyone's dying, it's only a few people. Pulitzer Prize winner, New York Times, and it turns out he was also on the Pentagon payroll. So, That's chapter 16 of the book. So you can read that and a lot of other things that are very revealing. Um, I'll just finish by quoting Amy, who says, that control of the information is even more deadly than control of the bombs. That's right. Because we couldn't do the bombs, we couldn't use the bombs and the weapons we're using if people knew what was happening. And Amy says, I think very correctly, if we saw for just one week the reality of what war is like in this country, we would end war in the 21st century. So, gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to introduce Dennis Kahn, who then will introduce, when he's done, um, the other speaker, Lorraine Moray. I've been practicing to try and, oh, she, here she is. Did I say your name right? More or less, okay. And, um, Perfect. <coughs> hmm? Perfect. Perfect, even, okay. And Dennis told me a few things about himself that I will say to introduce him. He was a medic in <coughs> the first Gulf War served over in the Gulf War and after the fighting was over quickly, he didn't have to stay in country and he came back. But he still has compensation from the Veterans Administration as a disabled veteran that no doubt he'll talk about. He comes from a long line of military veterans and he travels around the world since October 2003. <clears throat> Not homeless, he says, because people everywhere let him stay at their home. And he's a musician, author, and his website, denniskine.com, D-E-N-N-I-S-K-Y-N-E.com, and I think there's information here that will have that on it too, um, has all the facts and information about his uh, album and his book, I know, which have both been reviewed well. So please welcome Dennis, who will speak to us. To be in Washington, I mean, I, uh, I was up here roughly about a year ago is when I started making my way into the Northwest. I started in Colville on the other side of the state and uh, learned a lot about the indigenous cultures, uh, some of the tragedies that have occurred there as well as Hanford and, and what's happening in the state of Washington with, with radiation. So I always like to localize my, my presentations and it's horrific what's happened around here, but it's horrific what's happening all over the country and what's happening all over the globe. Um, where I like to start is with the fact that I come from like just a truckload of gen generations of combatants, not just service members, combatants, like been on the battlefield all the way back to the Revolutionary and the Civil War on my mother's side. On my mother's side, my uncle retired as a full colonel from the United States Army, 
My grandfather on her side retired from the Air Force as a full colonel. World War II and Vietnam collectively covered between the two of them. My uncle birthed a dwarf baby. He passed away in his 20s, and my uncle denies that that's an Agent Orange problem. There's a continuous and perpetual denial that exists in this subtle indoctrination that the government could ever hurt you, because especially the Republicans, they're the ones who give us the pay raises. On my side, my father didn't serve in the military. He blew his knee out playing football at Stanford while he was at ROTC school. But he was educated by the Jesuits before that, so I have a real hard discipline, point of discipline. I've always taken myself very seriously. I'm trying to get away from that a little bit. Uh, his father, Joseph Arkine, was a master sergeant during World War II and fought in Japan. Or, I don't know if fought is the right word. Occupied. You hear the stories Amy Goodman's telling. William B. Kine served in World War I in the Navy. Peter B. Kine served in the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. He wrote books when he came home. One of them's called The Go-Getter, The Story of How to Be One. That's my great uncle, Peter B. Kine. And then we go back to Ireland after that, and they've been fighting over there for a while, too. So I just come from this indoctrinated system of discipline and military. Not necessarily support for the government, though. It's a really unique paradigm I was raising because I was raised in the Bay Area. Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz. I'm in dead center, which is now referred to as the capital of Silicon Valley, where there's more disposable money than anywhere in the world. And so my extended family is all hippies from Santa Cruz, punk rockers from Berkeley, brothers from Oakland, and gay people from San Francisco. That's who I grew up with. They won. They dug their claws into me hard enough to get me out of a system that was slowly indoctrinating me into accepting a nomination to the United States Military Academy at West Point from active duty. I was nominated, and I ended up going to Operation Desert Storm. A lot of people say, well, what do you think we can do, Dennis? Why are you doing this? I mean, my goodness, you've given up everything. I sold everything. I don't have a bedroom. I don't have a home, necessarily, like I was introduced. Everybody welcomes me. Why do you do it? I do it because it matters. Randy Rowland taught me that last time I was in Seattle. He taught me, Dennis, the reason you're doing it, because it matters. But the real reason I do it is because one of my college professors, Alana Darabji, explains to me in her book, Betrayal. She says, we can change the course of this whole ship in one generation. It generally happens in vocabulary and verbiage. What I referred to as juvenile diabetes and adult onset diabetes is now referred to as one and two. And diabetes is not chronological. It doesn't go one and two. It's either you got it as a child or you get it from sucking on too many candy bars when you're an adult. It's not one and two, but they're wordsmithing us all the time, and they wordsmith us on this particular element that they're using on the battlefield. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But Elena Darabji specifically says we can change the course of this thing in one generation. So while I'm always busy reaching out, I'm still and continuously trying to reach down to that next generation, whether you define it as 15 years or 20 years, we have to reach down, because that's what they're doing. They're reaching down, they're creating institutions where they're training young people in how to march, how to sing cadences, how to appeal to the government. They, I read a book out at the Lincoln Memorial. I open it up in the Lincoln Memorial Library. It says some people in America had the honor of being drafted to serve in Vietnam. That's wordsmithing. There's no honor in being drafted. <laughs> It's not the NFL or the NBA, but they're starting to make it sound like it. I fall for the commercials every once in a while still when somebody's rappelling on the side because an 18-year-old always wants a rush. I look at it, I go, well, I want to rappel. And then at the end it says, go Navy, and I know better. And I know better. And I still catch the hook sometimes. They're good at reaching down. We've got to get good at reaching down too. In 1990, I was sent to the Middle East to serve in Operation Desert Shield which was intended to protect Saudi Arabia from an invasion by Iraq. That's all a Desert Shield was, to shield Saudi Arabia from an invasion by Iraq. There was no comment of going forward and attacking anybody. We were sent there as a defense force. So we spent from August until January ramping up for a war that we had no idea we were going into. And what they did to us was they vaccinated us with vaccines, vaccines like anthrax, loaded with squalene. The squalene was meant to speed up the vaccination so that we could ship sooner. Because when you take a vaccination, you should take a breather, not a flight. We took a flight. We had dysentery. We had diarrhea. We barfed. We landed in Cement City. 
Well, now Norman Schwarzkopf in his book that he wrote after the battlefield says, in his title very specifically, it doesn't take a hero. And if you ever watched Wag the Dog, which was supposed to be about George Bush, not Bill Clinton, you'll realize what this book really means. That's why Schwarzkopf didn't run for president, because he wasn't a hero. And he knew he wasn't, and it's tough to get pressed. He wasn't Eisenhower. He wasn't anywhere near him. He was just PR, just like George Bush says, the media made me. But in his book, It Doesn't Take a Hero, he writes in the first page of the book, the very first page, he says, training revolved around a ritual called the annual training test. And I can see from my fellow veterans for peace, we know what the annual training test is. And all year we practiced routines we knew would be on that test, training for the test. It's a military concept. At the individual level, the squad level, the platoon level, all the way up to the battle group, two weeks before the test, we'd rehearse usually on the same terrain where the test itself would take place, it was really that Mickey Mouse. Even so, the first time I participated in one, I could see that the battle group did not perform well. The orders did not get out on time. The attack was carried out sloppily. That problems were there galore. Yet when we got our final score, it was 99.8%. <laughs> that was our culture. Admitting weakness was seen as failure. To manifest the can-do attitude expected of an airborne officer. To me, this seemed not only crazy, but incompatible with the standard of honesty we learned at West Point. That's the first page of the book about the war. And if anybody wonders why Jessica Lynch got lost, the commanding general couldn't even help her. What we have to remember about some of the memorandums they release to people is guys like Schwarzkopf really think they make it through the distribution system. They really do. They really think memorandums released down line go all the way down. But let's just assume they do. They don't make it to the reservists or the National Guardsmen. The update on depleted uranium came out long after the Common Task Training Manual. The last Common Task Training Manual published was 1994. The Common Task Training Manual that updates the CTT Manual on depleted uranium comes out on a piece of paper that they throw out the door and hope somebody catches it and gets it down to the lowest guy. Remember in those old files where you catch a file and put it in the binder with it? That's how you kept track of things. They don't want them keeping track of things. They didn't want us to know how damaging this was. And if you think a 99.8% is a success when you know there's a failure, they fail even in the distribution of information. They control the information on us. On March 1st, 1991, Lieutenant Colonel Zeehan issues a memorandum that's very important. It's a very important memorandum. March 1st. Okay, so we get the vaccinations. We land in Cement City. For those of you who want to also look at the first page in Norm's book, you'll see this image right here. That's Cement City. Cement City was a concentration camp. We stayed there for 90 days waiting for our vehicles to come because our vehicles shipped out of Florida and we got on a plane. I guess they didn't know that the ships and the planes aren't operating at the same speed. So we sat in that tent city for 90 days waiting for our vehicles to come where we ingested sand particles and cement particles because it was an old cement factory. We ingested them day in and day out, got dysentery, mass exodus of the fluids, heat casualties in 150 degree heat with no water, heat stroke, Doc Kine comes in and is pushing IVs all day long. In addition to this, we were eating food grown in night soil. The link here is that the Chinese created a system where they could use night soil high in nitrogen based on fecal matter because it's not an, a soil-based agricultural system. It's a sand-based agricultural system. Now, I grew up in apartments. I don't even know what farming is necessarily, but I now am making the difference between agricultural bases. And we didn't even know what was happening in the sand. So they're growing food. And what you don't want to do is feed soldiers out of those metal tins and out of those plastic bags right off the bat. Most of us know that the meal ready eat is just intended to constipate us so we don't have a number two on the battlefield. It's not really meant to provide us nutrients. So they want to give us hot meals to make us feel like we're eating hot meals rather than meals ready to eat, grown in night soil. Soldiers were sick, tough it out in the concentration camp for 90 days. Then we moved forward when the vehicles arrived and we ended up walking into areas that necessarily looked safe. You thought they were safe, felt safe, but they had poisonous vectors and rodents. And the reason they had them out there was because nothing survives out there that isn't poisonous, probably. And they never seen the kind of water we brought with us. Doesn't rain there much. 
And they'd never seen the type of fecal matter we brought with us, which arrived with us in these metal bins that you can see a picture of me burning out in the morning. In the morning, we'd t tear this metal bin out of the latrine, dump gas in it, and cook it. But during the day, when the bucket filled up, there might be a rodent that was having dinner in there. So when the reaction came, you could lose a buttock or a testicle. It happened. There's the bin. The other occurrence was in the shower when you'd pull the water down and you were standing on a pallet where the rodent would be enjoying shade and wa water, cooling out, water spigot, reaction, soldier loses a calf or a foot. We're sending people to the rear. They're bringing herbicides and pesticides forward to kill the poisonous vectors and rodents. So now we have a situation. Soldiers walking into herbicides and pesticides all day long. The commander, and you can read about it in my book, Support the Truth, lost himself. He just completely lost himself, and Doc Kine got assigned to make sure the commander didn't die or kill himself because we don't want to lose the commander out of everybody, even though he's pretty much functionless and dysfunctional himself. So I'm babysitting him for most of the time, and then he goes ahead and gives the order to the soldiers to eat pyristigmin bromide tablets, which were intended to block off our synapses should we ingest a biological or a chemical agent. It wouldn't rip through our nerve endings. It was made in Holland, never saw the FDA, and we were eating it. Three times a day, seven days a week. I projectile vomited. I quit. So I'm not going to eat that. There's no way I can care for a sick soldier if I'm sick. So I quit eating them. That was in January. On January 17th, we started bombing Iraq. We bombed them for 45 days. From January 17th to February 28th, we dumped 340 tons of depleted uranium on the southern tip of Iraq and in Kuwait. One ton is 2,000 pounds. It's a lot of poundage. So we're dumping poundage of DU on the southern tip of Iraq, exposing the nomads, the semi-nomadic people, and the Bedouins of the community, as well as people who are in Kuwait. Okay, for 45 days they bomb till February 28th, and then we go forward into the 72-hour ground war, which is remembered and illustrated as the greatest victory in all of history of war. It wasn't. It was a failure. An absolute failure that led to over a half of a million soldiers filing a claim against the Veterans Administration and 11,000 soldiers from Desert Storm are dead. 11,000 dead. They're controlling the information. So really what's happening here is, in, if we think about the Trinity test in Los Alamos where they send up the bomb and then they walk the soldiers into it without sunglasses and everything, they just bomb for 45 days and then walk us into it. No different. While the scientists might refer to it as aerosolized particles, I call it radioactive fallout. All my military manuals refer to it as radioactive fallout. If a depleted uranium round hits somewhere, what we're supposed to do is put an international marker, i.e. triangular international marker, that says Adam in English and Adam in Russian, because that was who our opponent was during the Cold War, and that's who these symbols were generally made for. If a depleted uranium hits, we put the triangle up. That's the CTT update that goes out the window and hopes it gets to the lowest guy that isn't in the 1994 published CTT manual. But before the 1994 CTT manual, in all of the military manuals you'll find, this element was referred to as DOLRAM, depleted uranium low-level radioactive material. DOLRAM had its own acronym. Like in Chicago, when they were going to the dumps, it was a low-level radioactive dump, and then they just cut it off. It's just a dump now. <laughs> They're just chopping acronyms in half to get us confused, so the soldiers coming through now a decade later call it DU. We never even knew what it was. The original term for it is DOLRAM, depleted uranium, low-level radioactive material after 1991, or during 1991, that was slashed to become DU. And the original documents say little d, big U, little d descriptive, big U element. Now it's big D, big U. They're trying to make this thing an element. It's U-238 is what it is. It's the last stable element on the chart. The minute you bring it up from the ground, it becomes unstable. It's called mass defect. It emits radiation the minute it gets some air. Why did we end up there, though? We were supposed to go all the way to Baghdad. That was what we were doing in the 18th Airborne Corps. We were on the Iraqi Saudi Arabia side. We were going forward to Baghdad. The Seventh Corps was on the Kuwaiti uh, Saudi Arabia side and was going to go in and take care of Kuwait. We were going all the way to Baghdad. But what happened in the ignorance of our, I mean, we had never trained in the desert. 
I'd done some jungle training, you know. I never, I never even had any idea about a wadi. In Webster's, it's defined as a free-flowing river in Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, swallowed up by the sand, is real. We were swallowed up by the sand. So our support vehicles couldn't get through these wadis. So we hung what was later on referred to as a right hook or a sweep. USA Today reported it as the sweep because we couldn't go forward, so we just changed the definition of what we were doing and said we were liberating Kuwait by coming on a swing. Well, we all know that Saddam Hussein left long before that ever started. He said that I'm not fighting 34 of the world's militaries. I'll go back to Baghdad and wait for you. We never made it. We couldn't make it through the wadis. We hung a right turn onto what was later referred to as the highway of death. There's only one way into Baghdad and one way to Basra. It's one highway and it runs along the Euphrates River. And what that means is when you see the TV of going into Baghdad this time, this is why it makes sense that you see all the Kafji, Baghdad, all the, the signs for the cities because they already knew from 14 years ago that the vehicles can't make it through the sand. So they took them on the freeway to Baghdad because we couldn't last time. It was too contaminated and they ran the tanks along the side. That was the battle plan this time. It's descripted and right on CNN you can watch it. So basically we ran into the highway of death. 72 hours after we went over the berm, we were going back to Daha Ran. 72 hours later. At the same time, Carol Pacu, Doug Rocky, a number of other people were coming forward to investigate, see what's happening with depleted uranium. And the reason that happened was because on March 1st, Lieutenant Colonel Zeehan issued a memorandum that says specifically, there has been and continues to be a concern regarding the impact of little d big U on the environment. Therefore, if no one makes a case for the effectiveness of the little d big U on the battlefield, little d big U rounds may become politically unacceptable and thus be deleted from the arsenal. It's March 1st. On March 3rd, the ceasefire came. On March 8th, a memorandum was issued stating these soldiers need to be in protective gear. I was already gone by then when that memorandum came out. Carol Pacu was building a hospital on the side of the freeway. Because her unit split in half, 300 people, 150 went forward, 150 stayed back. Most of the people that went forward were women. Because the archaic womb of consciousness and maternity said, I'm going to go up and take care of somebody, while the men sat in the back and smoked cigarettes and played spades all day. So the effect really affects a lot of females from this conflict. March 1, March 3, March 8, who controls the information? Same game, whoever frames the debate wins the debate. We never saw any of this document, ever. So the experience I have is I'm just lucky. I'm just very lucky that I didn't trash my immune system before I walked into the radiation and I didn't stay in the radiation that long. That's why I'm alive. That's why I can talk about it. If my immune system had been trashed anymore, who knows? If I had breathed in any more dust particles or taken in any more gamma radiation, who knows? I'm a lucky human being and that's why I gave up everything to come out and tell you about the experience. The experience took me to the Veterans Administration. A lot of people who work in the VA have a problem with what I did for some reason. But what I did was I walked off of Fort Benning, Georgia and walked over to the Veterans Administration and filed a claim with the VA while I was still a soldier. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be reliant on the Department of Defense to take care of you. But my uncle, that full colonel, sat on the medical evaluation board at Fort Gordon, Georgia. The way you make colonel in the army is you lie. Most people get passed over at light colonel and retire as a lieutenant colonel. To make that next bump, you usually had to, uh, did a very big favor. The favor he did was that he was an infantry officer in Vietnam. What's he doing sitting on a medical evaluation board for people? But he sat there and that's where he retired from and I kind of got the game. So I knew that the DOD wasn't looking after anybody already. And I knew he didn't care about his own son who died of it as dwarfism. So I went to the VA and I started asking questions. In 1995, and what we have to remember is that the VA in this period is totally autonomous from the DOD. It becomes more inclusive and you can read about it in the, in the Fort Lewis Ranger a couple days ago. The VA and the DOD are jumping in bed right now together. They always have been somewhat, but their computer systems couldn't check. The DOD couldn't check whether I was down here filing this VA paperwork. Or maybe they could and they just didn't. So I go to the VA in 1995. They put me in, because I was in the test groups. I was in the rosters. They didn't know that I was a drill sergeant on Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in Fort Bliss, Texas. They had no idea. 
I ha conducted most of my work with them by way of paperwork, used my mother's address in, Ca in Campbell, California. It's where all the paperwork went through. In 1995, they tested me for ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation. It's the same document, just two different dates. Ionizing radiation they tested me for. Inside the Veterans Administration Federal Handbook for Benefits, it states specifically there's 91 study groups. Two of them have to do with the situation I have. One of them is an ionizing radiation study group, and the other one is a depleted uranium Gulf War study group. So I've been tested for ionizing radiation. In 1995, the Veterans Administration started paying me. Now I'm dragging two checks, one from the VA and one from the DOD. <laughs> it says here, it says the evaluation of undiagnosed illness manifested by chest pain, shortness of breath, back pain, abdominal pain with nausea and vomiting, headaches and fatigue is continued as disabling. This document came to me on May 23rd, 96. This is called the string along. So I participated in the string along. And that's what this is. They string soldiers along for years. My brother-in-law served further forward than me in an isolated unit, kind of a one-man unit, if you will, where he captured Iraqi weapons and took them back to the rear and gave them to the French, the Germans, whoever paid the most money so they could research them. My sister had an ectopic pregnancy. He's a 100% disabled veteran, and they call him an AIDS patient or a cancer victim. My stepbrother was a security patrol officer in Daha Ran where we beat feet back to, and his job was to crawl underneath the vehicles and clank on them to make sure there was no bombs underneath. So all the particulate matter from the battlefield was falling in his face. His children expressed signs and symptoms, much like any child born to somebody who's exposed to the radiation. There's another study group that occurs, though. This is why I dodged the DOD. This is Lieutenant Colonel Eric Daxon. Lieutenant Colonel, who later made Colonel, retired as a full Colonel. Or I don't even know if he's retired. Who knows what he's up to now, but he's not pushing this agenda anymore. The document reads, Protocol for Monitoring Gulf War Veterans with Embedded Depleted Uranium Fragments. Okay, take your pick. Is that Joseph Mengele? Stuffing uranium in a human being and seeing what it does to him. We know it's radioactive. We know it's the last stable element on the chart. We know it emits radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. And they're leaving it in soldiers. Problem number one is that the only way this happens is friendly fire incidents. That's it. There's nothing that could take out an M1A1 on that battlefield. So if you've got an embedded depleted uranium fragment in your body, it's because one of your helicopters took out one of your tanks. That's how that happens. Okay. Maybe that isn't bad enough. If you want to type Daxon's name into Amazon.com or depleted uranium, Daxon, into Amazon.com, you'll see this document was given a UPC code and is for sale there or was for sale there at one point. It's not available and it's out of date or however you do it when things don't get published anymore, but okay, if it's not Joseph Mengel, it's definitely war profiteering. I mean, the guy's making money somewhere off this document on a commercial website. So... What I want to talk to you a little bit now is that the evidence is in, it's been in, it's totally clear. In 1994, Stone Phillips and Gene Pauley on a Dateline video interview Cal Waller, the second in command. He was right below Norm Schwarzkopf. He's the one who orchestrated the, the, the tank battle. He later became the commander of Fort Lewis. So Cal Waller was a hero up in these parts for a while too. And what Stone Phillips is asking Cal Waller, he's saying, well, have you ever seen that March 8th document I'm referring to about the soldiers needed to be protected? He goes, no, I've never seen this document. Norm never saw this document. We never saw this document. These are the guys in charge. This is where we know the distribution mechanism doesn't work. If the two guys in charge can't seem to locate a document that should have made it to me down at the bottom level, then we know there's a problem. And a short time later in this uh, interview, you see General Blank, a two-star general. Stone Phillips says, something's wrong. General Blank says, it, uh, it's indicative the Army dropped the ball. Stone says, who dropped the ball? Blank says, I don't know. Two-star general, I don't know. How can you not know? How can you talk about supporting the troops, protecting the health and welfare of the troops, conserving their strength, if you don't know where do I identify what the problem is? That's just systems analysis. Where's the problem? Fix the problem so the system still works. This is a two-star general who can't even think about this. In addition to this, you see Carol Piku talk about going to the, taking the hospital up front. You also find a doctor who found uranium and contaminants in her. 
And in addition to this, you see Daryl Kennedy, whose daughter was birthed looking like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It was a radiation expression. 1994 Dateline video, which I found by hanging out in Washington, D.C. around Prop 1. Prop 1 are the folks, Conchita, that have been sitting vigil in front of the White House in protest of nuclear proliferation since 1983. They took me to their house. They showed me this video. I said, okay, this is, a, this is it. But in addition to this particular video, Life did an article called The Tiny Victims of Desert Storm in 1994. And it illustrates children being birthed to Desert Storm veterans that resemble babies birthed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is where the link comes in. In 1997, in congressional testimony, Congressman Shays is holding court with four returning U.S. soldiers. One of them is Colonel Gilbert Roman. They're with their wives who've fallen apart. They've fallen apart. Everybody in the family has fallen apart. This is how that happens. Soldiers are always promised the loot. They're always promised the spoils of war. They're always promised the gold, the guns, and the women. It's been like that for centuries, and it's not any different today. You can't export democracy through the barrel of a gun. You can't take a system that indoctrinates people into authoritative machinery and not have that new citizen they're working for become the bottom of the totem pole. It goes colonel, sergeant, private, Iraqi citizen. That's the vertical chain of command now. There's no democracy. There's nobody saying, hey, you can say or do whatever you want. You can't export it through the barrel of a gun. So Christopher Shays is asking some of these soldiers, Asaf Durakovich, who's the nuclear medicine doctor in 1991, during Desert Storm at the Department of Defense, what's happening? Asaf Durakovich has diagnosed Gulf War Syndrome with a causal relationship to depleted uranium. He was a full colonel. He was a full colonel. He outranked Dax and he outranked all these clowns and he got terminated and he runs the Uranium Medical Research Center in Canada now testing returning veterans. Major Rocky, in addition to Asaf Durakovich, was identified by name to research the implications of depleted uranium and write supporting evidence for the use of it on the battlefield. He was a first lieutenant, but he had 19 years as an enlisted soldier before he became a lieutenant. I'm sure they thought Lieutenant Rocky wanted to make colonel and that he would go ahead and doctor documents and do whatever he needed to do to get promoted. He decided not to. He decided to look out for those soldiers he served with for those 19 years, the ones who get the butt end, and he's been doing it ever since. So Christopher Shays in Connecticut is holding court. Currently, Connecticut has passed a bill stating that all returning soldiers from Afghanistan or Iraq will be tested for depleted uranium. It's the freshest thing on the market. So while we're busy reaching down, when we're reaching out, we need to reach out to our governors, who are the commander in chief of the National Guard. Just because Donnie says that it's an integrated fighting force, the governor has always been the commander in chief of the National Guard. We need to take it back and do independent research on our National Guardsmen because we're going to talk about some of those guys who are sick right now. I'd like to briefly, or maybe it'll be a little bit longer than brief, talk to you about some of the things I've learned about uranium. I have a degree in political science. I studied nuclear proliferation. I studied the SALT treaties and the START treaties and the NPT treaties. And when I graduated from college, I really believed the Cold War was over. I really believed that nuclear proliferation had ended because we no longer had an enemy. I believed all the generals that said, I've lived in a world where I always knew who the enemy is and I don't know who the enemy is anymore. I guess I'll retire. I lived there. I believed that. I still didn't know that depleted uranium had been used on the battlefield. Marshall Libby writes about it in a book called The Uranium People. She says, critics have complained that more than half a million gallons of radioactive liquid have leaked from storage tanks at Hanford. The liquid contains plutonium, strontium-90, and cesium-137. It has leaked into the groundwater table with consequences not fully determined. 1979, youngest person on the Manhattan Project advocating the use of nuclear reactors, writes this, that she has no idea what cesium-137, strontium-90, or plutonium do to the human being. So we know these physicists who were developing nuclear reactors had no idea what this does to the gene pool. And is there anybody in here who is slightly confused about what these three elements do to the chromosomes in the gene pool? They trash them. A couple chapters later, she says, no one has ever been hurt by tritium. <laughs> if you drink tritated water, it comes out in urine in a couple of days. Each tritium decay is so weak it can only hurt one cell. Duh, cells reproduce. 
So these people didn't have any idea about the genetic code, which I've had the opportunity to study with uh, Marion Folk, thanks to Loren Murray who introduced me to him. He is a Manhattan Project guy from the University of Chicago, and he's been able to explain to me a couple things. One of the things he did do was hand me a copy of the McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. It's dated 1997. It's the eighth edition, the 20th volume, and it cost $2,500 for the whole series. So it isn't like showing him the luckies when I was a kid. My first encyclopedia series came from the shelves of a grocery store because they were selling them for a buck a piece after you bought the first three or something. It wasn't $2,500. Those who got the information control the information, and I got the information from a genius. I never get it from the grocery store. The McGraw-Hill specifically says uranium-238 absorbs slow neutrons to form uranium-239, which in turn decays to fissile plutonium-239 by the emission of two beta particles. Do you think that after you've dumped 340 tons of little d big U, as in uranium-238, there's a potential to leave plutonium, cesium-137, and strontium-90 on the battlefield? I think so. I think after 340 tons, you're reaching something that is way outside of any test tube they ever put anything in. There's an article at my website that's entitled, What Happened to the Test Tube Paradigm? In eighth grade, my science teacher said, if it doesn't meet the test tube paradigm, there's no reason to do science. For example, if you can't duplicate what's happening in the real world in the test tube, then you'll never know what's going to happen in the real world. The test tube was us. We were the guys walked in to the 340 tons of depleted uranium. So in a little while further in this book, we learn that there's 21 phases of oxidation for uranium. 21 phases, meaning when it mixes with other elements in the sphere, it can change into other elements and they're all deadly. 21 phases of that. And then on page 93 of this McGraw-Hill, it says, an interesting deposit is the one at Oklo Gabon. When in primordial times, a spontaneous fission reaction occurred which caused a shift in the isotopic composition of the uranium in the deposit. They don't need us to have a fissionable event. So you can have a spontaneous one. You can put 340 tons of it on the battlefield, and you can expect something other than whatever grandiose idea they gave the people when they said, it's armor piercing. They're upset because we're whooping their butts. Let's grant that it's armor piercing. There's no tanks in Afghanistan. There's hardly maybe three or four tanks left in Iraq because we buried them all last time. We've used it in... Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, potentially Somalia. If you watch the Panama deception, Roberto Duran is in there going, what happened to my city back here, man? This thing is melted, melted. Now, granted, there's a lot of vegetative architecture there, but I think maybe they might have used one there too. And so really, the concept I'm thinking about here is what's happening with the current crop? Because the same Veterans Administration manual I refer to states specifically that the Gulf War started on 2 August 1990. On 2 August 1990, the beginning of Operation Desert Shield begins. If you read that Federal Book of Veterans Benefits, it states very specifically, it starts on 2 August 1990 and it will end on a date to be determined by Congress. It's the same war. It's not over yet. The federal books state specifically it started on 2 August 90 and will end on a date to be determined by Congress. We are all Gulf War era vets. We have Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Operation Northern Watch, Operation Southern Watch, Operation Desert Fox, Operation Iraqi Fee Freedom. Oh, I'm sorry. Operation Iraqi Liberation, OIL, but Ara Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Iraqi Enduring Freedom. Just like in Vietnam, the police engagement led to a lot of battles and well, massacres, My Lai Massacre, or particular battles, what they're doing this time is calling it one war, Gulf War, bunch of operations in it. It's the media who defined it as one and two. There was no one until there was two. It's the same thing as diabetes. It's not chronological. It's all one thing. They use chronologically to take two separate things and make it one. It's unique the way they can shift things on us, but this is all one war. And in 14 years, the statistics are horrific of how many people have gone. In Operation Desert Fox, they just issued 0% disabilities to whom they knew they'd been on a contaminated battlefield. Here's a 0% disability. You can go to the VA anytime you want to. Kept the claim paperwork down just to issue those. This time, they're guaranteeing people two years of VA service when they come back. 
regardless of what unit or where they were. You get two years free, don't worry, you'll be better by then. It keeps the claims down. They're softening up the middle and keeping the claims down. So just a couple weeks ago, I was out in New York at Congressman Hinchy's office speaking with his, uh, his staff associate, uh, Dan Ahouse. And in came a phone call from the Bronx, from Herbert Reed. Herbert Reed volunteered for the infantry in Vietnam. He was an infantry volunteer. I mean, like if you want to think about, like to me, what the craziest thing you could have ever done was volunteer for the infantry in Vietnam. Herbert Reed did it. Herbert Reed didn't go to Vietnam, though. Herbert Reed was assigned to the Big Red One at Fort Riley, Kansas, where he served by not, he didn't have to go to combat. And he's telling Dan Ahouse and Congressman Hinchy's office, he's saying, man, I dodged Agent Orange. I got in Iraq with the 442nd, and I was exposed to uranium, and I can barely move now. Ossoff Durakovich tested Herbert Reed Paid for by the New York Daily News, Juan Gonzalez is reporting on this over a year ago. Ossoff Durakovich, the colonel from 1991 who was terminated, tests Herbert Reed by uranium-236 in his body. Uranium-236 is not on the periodic table of charts. It's a byproduct as well as cesium-137, strontium-90. If you got U-236 in there, you had a chemical reaction on that battlefield that wasn't in the test tube, obviously. So Herbert Reed is not a peacenik. Not a peacenik by any means. He spent three decades somewhat, I mean, I even had to comment on the side that it seemed type of, some sort of dense to, to spend that long. But the guy was a prison guard at Rikers. He was a prison guard at Rikers. He was in the National Guard. He had a total sense of service from that other side of the line. And he's calling in and he's sick. And Senator Hillary Clinton picked up the news when it came home. Senator Hillary Clinton offered to take over, intervene on behalf of the US government and say, I'll make sure the soldiers get their just due. OK. This letter was written on April 7, 2004, over a year ago, after Herbert Reed had been tested. The letter was signed by Ellen P. Embry, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Not by Donald Rumsfeld. It was written by a female who will probably take the hit later on in life for being wrong because Rumsfeld never would be. But the science in here is like somebody broke out my niece's crayons and did science with it. It's pathetic. And I mean, have a glance at it. This is what one of our 100 senators is doing. Well, the one of our 100 senators happens to have had a husband who dropped that uranium all over Kosovo and Yugoslavia. I'm not saying there's a gatekeeper in the house, but it sure looks like there's one. So what I do regularly is I call Joshua Albert, who is Senator Clinton's staffer, who's in charge. He's probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, mid-20s, late-20s. What's that? They're kids. They're kids. I say, Josh, what's happening? Herbert's still sick. Darren Matthews in the Bronx as well, birthed a baby with three fingers and no wrist and a thyroid problem. Josh, what's happening? Well, she's working on it. No, really. We've got to do a little bit better than that. It's been a year since this crazy letter came out. What's going on? She's working on it, Mr. Kine. That's the response I'm getting from this guy, who's being told that most people will just take, we're working on it. That's a senator. While we won't investigate the death of a senator like Paul Wellstone, we sure can't even investigate why we can't, any, can't get any depleted uranium help for Herbert Reed and Darren Matthews from the Bronx who have been confirmed to be exposed. The evidence from 97 and 1994 is just totally conclusive. The studies coming out of conferences and findings now are completely conclusive. And they continue to wordsmith, not just the people, but the politicians. So Herbert Reed, Darren Matthews, and a number of other soldiers are coming home with malignancies that are moving way too quick. They're just way too fast. If we remember last summer, they were telling us that soldiers contracted pneumonia in the middle of the desert. Pneumonia. Do we have anybody in here that thinks it's possible to catch pneumonia in 130 degree heat? Pneumonia comes from dampness. It's fluid in the lungs. Now, my specialty was like IVs and pushing on people's chests when they went into cardiac arrest, but nobody had pneumonia when I was there. We spent nine months there and we never got any pneumonia. So what's happening is a couple days later, these soldiers are dying from lymphoma and fibromyglia. 
How's that happen? How do you have pneumonia one day? You're a 43-year-old marathon runner, and you're dead in three days. That's how fast it was happening one summer ago. And the difference and the equation I like to make is this. We bombed for 45 days, settled, and then we went in. This time they bombed and marched forward simultaneously. It's a huge difference to go walking into a hot zone. Depleted uranium is hot. It's called ground zero. Oppenheimer did the study. Uranium on uranium creates a nuclear reaction. These soldiers were walking into it the day it was being fired. It's a different test. It's not the particulate matter test. It's the hot test. The manual states specifically these areas can be hot for three to five days. So if you're marching as the bombing is going on, it might look like pneumonia, but it's really just displaced organs, maybe bleeding, maybe something that's forcing you to look, sound and appear fluidated, and then you're dead of cancer a couple days later. Now what the soldiers are doing over there is breathing in particulate matter. And we're going to see some results of that coming down the road, too. When I was there, we walked into that stuff, and I am not lying to you. We only spent three days there. But as a medic, the signs and symptoms I was looking at resembled what some of you Vietnam veterans might remember as the thousand-yard stare. In World War II, it was shell shock, and in World War I, it was soldier's heart. So the soldiers are just walking around like this in chow hall lines. Well, what's wrong with them? I, man, it's a little messed up. They must have been in some battle we haven't heard about yet. <laughs> I mean, I know I wasn't in any battles. 24th Infantry Division wasn't in any many battles. But on the way back, as you're moving back, you're moving back through the facilities that you built on your way up. So they're coming from a half a million man army that's going back through the funnel to get back to the rear. So we're amongst them. So all of them are in different levels of exposure. But it's easily identifiable, right? We dumped this much here, the 24th is here. We dumped this much here, the 82nd is here. We dumped this much here, the 1st ACR is here. We dumped this much here, the 7th Corps is here. We were the study group. We are the first known group of people to walk in to a place that had been bombed for 45 days and cooked off particulate matter that becomes smaller than bacteria or viruses and can pass through our filters. So even if we were protected, as Stone Phillips and Cal Waller say, we still had the potential to be contaminated. The soldiers were sick, they were vomiting, they were nauseous, they were violent. There was suicides, there was homicides, all the way back. And when you start taking a soldier and telling them that you're on your way home, but you're going to wait, like they're doing to them now, you're on your way home, but you're part of stop loss, you'll be home in a month, but you're still there three months later, you become suicidal. That level of uncertainty and that level of stress are so overwhelming. Kick in a little depleted uranium and radiation exposure, nausea and vomiting and the endless pain you have, suicides and homicides became prevalent. And that's on our way back. We make it to Daha Ran, I end up on a TWA aircraft private airplane flying home. I flew there on a C-130 or a C-141, and I flew home on TWA because we were sick. Everybody was sick, and we were all the way forward. They took the most forward people, got them out there the first, telling us that we're taking care of you because you spent so much time on the front line. But really, we were that sick. I have a friend who was a crew chief in the 498th Air Ambulance Company. Dust off, if you will, bringing helicopters in. His unit didn't get to come back. I was a ground ambulance medic. They were the dust-off units. The, the birds stayed forward. He came home much later. He went to Martin Army Community Hospital, and his skin peeled away. And I forgot about it. I knew it was happening, and I just went on. Because that's what you do. You live in denial. That it, it's not going to happen to me. But I was continuously reminded of it, because everywhere I went, even when I went home, one of my friends from that unit became a San Jose police officer. Years later, I bumped into him, and he reminded me, did you know? And I said, yes, I know. Thank you for the reminder. Still in denial. Like, it must have been an isolated incident. It must have been all by itself. But it wasn't. There's a number of accounts of veterans from Desert Storm having their organs displaced. They make up the 11,000 who are dead. The skin is the largest organ on the human body. It reproduces. It needs water. It's our largest organ, and it's affected by radiation. It's just the way it is. The human being is the least resilient creature to radiation. Why are they walking us into 340 tons of it when they know it's depleted uranium, low-level radioactive material? So this is my dilemma. It's why I'm prepared to give everything up, because I think we're going nowhere. I mean, I really think that the, the, we're perpetuating something that is like, 
I mean, I can't say it's mystical, but there's got to be some word of unknown about where this is going when we're birthing babies that have the potential to not procreate themselves. In a civilized society where you totally are complicit in the birth of children who might not reach the age of procreation themselves, you have the tendency and the potential to extinct. That's the idea here. So I don't know where we're going. So the path I've taken is one to reach down to the next generation to see if we can work on this kind of on a counter result, if you will. So this is what I do. And I've been doing it for two years now. I was discharged from the Army. Actually, it was the National Guard. The last unit I went and served with was the United States Army Band. It was the 59th Army Band in California. It's the furthest thing from the battlefield you can get. I was a guitar player. I am a guitar player, but I can't read music. So the first band commander said, I won't take you. The second one said, you look like Audie Murphy. I want you. So I played guitar for the jazz combos at recruiting and retention commands and things like that. And on January of 2003, it looked like we were going back over there. And when that happens, band members become military police officers. So I told my commander, I said, I'm not doing that, man. I get it. I get the whole thing now. It's all very clear to me. And I departed and went into the individual ready reserve component from January of 2003 until September of 2003, where I was issued an honorable discharge. So I have an honorable discharge from active duty, from the reserves, and the guard. I have all kinds of honorable discharges. And I left. But I didn't want to file conscientious objector status. I didn't want to go to the brig. I wanted to go to work. And I've been working since October of 2003 at the Hamburg conference in Germany. One month after I got out with an honorable discharge, I was sitting in Hamburg, Germany, speaking with the international community on the fact that since I've been in the military, we've been training United States Army soldiers to respond to nuclear weapons, training them to. The way we train them is to lay down and put their head into the blast and cover their eyes and their ears. That's the training they get. It's a joke, but we're, at least we're talking about it, which I don't think too many people are. And so I reported to this conference, and I started getting more and more scared. Because Lorraine Murray showed me the periodic table, the advanced one, and on it, elements 116 and 118 have been retracted. They come from Lawrence Berkeley. They've been retracted. Not discontinued. They've been retracted. We've got some scientific problems going on where they're creating elements to go on the chart based on federal money. And then when the international community finds them, they say, no, nah, we can't duplicate that. We'll have to retract it. So I go to this conference. I swear they're speaking Swahili. Mm -hmm. I didn't lie. I was like, whoa, Strontium 90. Cesium, what are you talking about? How come I don't know these terms? Well, we don't know these terms because you won't find them on the chart either. Those are byproducts of a fissionable event. Are there any questions real briefly? OK, so what happens is the Trojan Horses of Nuclear War is the title of the conference. It's titled after Lorraine Murray's seminal work entitled the same thing, The Trojan Horses in Nuclear War. It's her seminal work. It articulates all kinds of scientific findings and resolutions. They titled the conference after it, were there Iraqi doctors, German doctors, French doctors, German doctors from all over the world articulating the same thing. It aberrates the chromosomes, alters the genetic makeup, and has the potential to contaminate the blood system. For example, our blood system, where the soldiers are the number one donor to the Red Cross. It contaminates our organ donor system. It contaminates everything. I catch that part. I have to go home and work on the science with Marion and Lorraine. So I met Lorraine at a, at, a, at, a, at a rally in San Francisco. I was out handing out pictures <coughs> that, uh, that showed the implications of what depleted uranium does to, on the battlefield. My friend Seth Rick, we made friends immediately. He's a third generation pacifist. I'm a fifth generation military guy. Just like that, we knew it was the right place at the right time. He says, do you know Lorraine Murray? I said, no. A couple days later, I'm at the Iraqi Community Center in Sunnyvale, California. Lorraine Murray speaking. She explains and describes why this weapon is actually omnicidal. I do have a decent background in the SALT treaties, the START treaties, nuclear proliferation, the damage radiation does on the human body. And I think, oh my goodness, it's omnicidal. I've been working ever since then. Then in, I was still in the military when I heard this. I was out on the streets protesting in that individual ready reserve period when I met my friend the pacifist. I hadn't gotten my honorable discharge yet. And I was out on the streets protesting. If you've ever seen the movie called We Interrupt This Empire, there's a drill sergeant in there yelling, 
We got smoked by radiological weapons. It's me. I'm dressed up like a drill sergeant, running around San Francisco telling everybody, I figured out what happened to us finally. I had the opportunity to share time with Doug Rocky, Lorraine Murray on a number of panels in the last couple years, and just based on the fact that her seminal research is entitled The Trojan Horse and Nuclear War, this conference is also entitled the same thing. It's always my honor to hang out with her and introduce her to you, Lorraine Murray. <laughs>